The Family Law Association resolutions say that the primary developmental task for infants is to bond with mum and dad and gain a sense of security in the world around them. This occurs through regular, consistent contact, for example, parents meeting their child's needs through daily activities such as changing, feeding, holding, interacting. When parents live apart, meeting this developmental need becomes more challenging. Parents will need to be more creative in how they share parenting time, as for infants, long periods of time away from either parent is not recommended. 27% of UK couples that were cohabiting when their child was born will have separated by the time the child is five years old. 9% of couples that were married when their child was born will have separated by their child's fifth birthday. I have some questions. Questions like, do babies know if their parents aren't happy? Questions like, does family separation harm children who are less than two when they split? And do babies cause divorce? I wanted to know because my youngest was one and a half when our family split, and this is what I found out. Researchers at Oxford University said fathers were often sidelined after a birth, depriving them of opportunities to bond with their baby. New fathers are suffering from a form of postnatal depression because of financial pressures and a lack of quality time with their child. They said many men are expected to carry on working hard to bring money in to support their family rather than act as co-parent in feeding and nappy changing. As a result, up to 10% of new fathers are experiencing depression in the six months after a baby's birth, with little support available from health professionals. With fathers who want to be more involved with their children, there is a tension between their need to provide and the wish to be at home. Having a baby can also put a strain on marital relationships, especially if the couple are not working as a team. And women can sometimes be guilty of maternal gatekeeping, whereby they see themselves as the primary carer. They do not empower the father to take control of caring for the baby. Over 120,000 British families with dependent children separated in 2013. It wasn't an unusual year. A question I'm often asked is, how do I get to see my children? It's not always um, a dad asking that question, but it is often. It, that's a really difficult one because um, when one parent has been prevented for whatever reason, sometimes rightly, often wrongly, from seeing their child, it's very emotional, it's very upsetting and it obviously makes um, that person very, very angry. And the first thing that they want to do is, is run off to court and get a court order, which is often perhaps the worst thing that they can do. A review of studies by the Father Involvement Research Alliance shows that babies with more involved fathers are more likely to be emotionally secure, confident in new situations and eager to explore their surroundings. As they grow, they are more sociable. Toddlers with involved fathers are better problem solvers and have higher IQs by age three. They are more ready to start school and can deal with the stress of being away from home all day, better than children with less involved fathers. At school, children of involved fathers do better academically. They are also less likely to have behaviour problems at school and less likely to experience depression. Girls with involved fathers have higher self-esteem and teenage girls who are close to their dads are less likely to have a teenage pregnancy. Boys show less aggression less impulsivity and more self-direction. As young adults, children of involved fathers are more likely to achieve higher levels of education, find success in their careers, have higher levels of self-acceptance and experience psychological well-being. Adults who had involved fathers are more likely to be tolerant and understanding, have supportive social networks made up of close friends and have long-term successful marriages. Canadian scientists believe growing up in a fatherless household could permanently alter the structure of the brain and produce children who are more aggressive. Dr. Gabriella Gobi of McGill University in Canada said that the main impacts were seen in the prefrontal cortex. More than one million children in the UK currently have no contact with their father while they are growing up, a figure that is growing by 20,000 a year. Are you going to Scarborough Fair? Sing parsley, sage, rosemary and thyme. Remember me to run who lives there. And she... Once was 
true love of mine Tell her to make me a cambric shirt Sing parsley, sage, rosemary and thyme Without any seams or needle She'll be a true love of mine Tell her to find me and make a roof land Sing parsley, sage, rosemary and thyme Then she'll be a true love of mine. Tell her to plow it with a sickle of leather. Sing parsley, sage, rosemary and thyme. Then she'll be a true love of mine. I read a UK study that showed that almost a third of the separated parents questioned attributed restless nights due to kids as the reason for their divorce. But I also read Office of National Statistics showing that having children or staying childless has no clear effect on the risk of divorce. Mark Goldston, MD, says that children per se don't cause divorce. He says that the conflict arises when the inner animal pleasure pain instinct to hurt their demanding, tantruming children is at odds with a less strong desire to protect them. When that conflict is too powerful, parents will deflect and displace it onto their spouse. They believe their marriage can take the slings and arrows of outrageous feelings they have towards their kids, and for that matter their parents and their bosses at work. What they fail to realise until it's too late is that the bond that is supposed to last until death do you part turns out to be the weakest link. Scientists claim that mothers who are stressed out in pregnancy transmit the effect to their unborn baby as early as 17 weeks. Pregnant women undergoing the trauma of a marital breakup may experience fluctuations in blood pressure that adversely affect the fetus. A distraught mother may likely deliver a depressed or distraught infant that may require intensive postnatal care due to a low birth weight or underdeveloped organs. A study of English mothers-to-be found that going through a major upheaval, such as a bereavement or separation, dramatically raised the odds of their baby suffering ill health by the age of four. The link with chronic conditions was particularly strong, with two bouts of severe stress in pregnancy raising the odds fivefold. Previous research has linked stress in the womb with lowering the unborn child's IQ and raising the odds of hyperactivity emotional problems and disobedience. Studies show that children of highly stressed and anxious pregnant women were at double the risk of hyperactivity and ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, at the age of four. Anxiety in pregnancy seems to have greater effects than antenatal depression, according to study findings. I've read that there is a cultural silence about how challenging it is to have a baby, financially, emotionally, and on a marriage. We accept that divorce and death are traumatic and condolences are offered when those life events occur, but when you're pregnant or expecting, everyone is so happy for you. We expect some challenges, but we don't discuss the deep frustration, total sleep deprivation, and heartbreaking questioning of self that comes with a new life. I've read that playing soft music or meditating in prayer will help calm the mother and even an unborn baby 
while undergoing the stress of marital breakup. I've read that during the nine-month gestation period, a pregnant woman's focus should primarily be on being physically and emotionally fit, not on being embroiled in a nasty battle with an estranged spouse. During infancy, babies are able to feel tension in the home and between their parents, but can't understand the reasoning behind the conflict. If the tension continues, babies may become irritable and clingy, especially around new people, and have frequent emotional outbursts. They may also tend to regress or show signs of developmental delay. Babies under duress caused by divorce may react by refusing to take a bottle or have increased susceptibility to colic. They may become restless or have digestive disorders such as diarrhoea or constipation, caused by nervousness or anxiety. Infants usually respond to a mother's emotional state and can sense when mum is under stress. During the toddler years, a child's main bond is with her parents, so any major disruption in her home life can be difficult for her to accept and comprehend. What's more, kids this age are self-centred and may think they've caused their parents' breakup. They may cry and may want more attention than usual, regress and return to thumb sucking, resist toilet training, have a fear of being abandoned or have trouble going to sleep or sleeping alone at night. Most commonly, children of separated couples will experience greater poverty. Studies have also shown that children whose biological parents have split up have worse outcomes in terms of social, emotional and cognitive development. This association remains regardless of whether the parents were married or cohabiting when the child was born. Children of separated parents are also more likely to have behavioural problems, exhibit antisocial behaviour and to take part in substance misuse. They also tend to perform worse at school and have poorer future employment prospects. Research also shows that children of separated couples are less likely to have successful relationships themselves as adults. If there are good relations between the parents, most will adjust to the new family situation after an initial period of unhappiness and instability. Having parents that get along better together when they live apart is better for a child than being part of a dysfunctional family unit with high levels of destructive conflict. So what can we do to help our children? Regular and consistent contact with both parents, routines and schedules maintained, minimised exposure to parental tension, predictable environment that's like regular bedtime and daily routines, child safe homes with both parents that allow for exploration and stimulation, regular contact with mum and dad, reassurance of love through physical affection and direct interaction. Some people say divorce is always going to be nasty, but I found there are reasons for that. One of the biggest is people not using mediation and collaborative law and arbitration. People need to stay out of court when they get a divorce. Therapists and many lawyers agree that keeping a separation from getting nasty is a good way to help your children. Well, I think the most important thing for couples to realise is that the impact that they're going to have on their children getting divorced is enormous. And all the research now shows that children survive divorce and adjust well if the parents act civilly and behave as friends. So the biggest mistake a lot of parents make is they get angry, rush off to lawyers, rush off to court and start a war. And I've had children actually come into my office and draw me their parents with guns shooting each other as a representation when I do art therapy with them of how violent and how angry the parents are at each other. So I think it's quite important for parents to realise that if you create a warring situation, your children are going to become victims of a war between two parents, both of whom they love and don't want to have to choose. So it creates quite unstable environments for the children. And if the parents actually realise that creating a, a harmony of separation and showing the children that if relationships don't work, you can move into two separate happy environments where they can see a happy mom and a happy daddy and create a situation where the family can work together in harmony rather than in such a, an angry, violent situation which then affects the children at school, it affects their friendships, it affects the parents going to work. Like for example, I had one um, wife 
who told the husband she can only see the children from five in the afternoon till seven. But he worked in the city and usually couldn't get home before nine. So he then had to ask for a leave of absence, um, well not leave of absence, an early half day every Wednesday to leave the office by half past three to get to the kids by five o'clock to be able to see his children during the week. And that kind, so of course he became resentful because it started affecting the impact on his job. Um, she didn't care actually because they were just, she was angry that he wanted the divorce. And they were just landing up where eventually got to the point where one of the children actually came into my office and said, I don't actually want to live with either one of them, I want to go to boarding school. And this little boy was like nine years old because he literally put his hand over his ears and said, I can't take this anymore. You know, all they do is fight and all they do is yell at each other and daddy's always angry he has to leave work and mommy's always angry that daddy left and it just becomes this very uncomfortable situation for everybody. So the children are unhappy, the parents are unhappy, the employers are unhappy, you know, it starts affecting everything, you know, output, income, um, promotions, bonuses, you know, the whole life of the family is then stuck in trauma rather than moving towards healing because the parents aren't at all. Ian Duncan Smith has been quoted in The Telegraph saying, companies should intervene and help employees going through marital breakup to prevent them crashing out of work and ending up on benefits. Family breakdown has been estimated to cost the UK taxpayer almost £46 billion a year through the effects on health, extra housing support, lost work hours, legal aid and other related factors. That's more than we spend on defence. The biggest misconception I have in family law matters is you get some parts who just want to have a good fight. And I'm telling you this now, if you have a good fight and you spend £20,000 on the privilege of legal representation all the way to a final hearing, just in the finances, forget even dealing with the children, that's a whole separate set of costs, just to hear a judge tell you what your lawyer or your mediator told you right at the outset of the case the outcome would be, you'll feel a lot more demoralised than you realise. There are no winners in family law matters, there really aren't, people don't understand that it's not the same as other traditional forms of litigation, there is no winner, there is no loser, in some ways both parties lose because the relationship is broken down and there's all the emotional issues that flow from that. So anybody who thinks, oh, well I'll avoid mediation or collaborative law or arbitration because I want a good almighty scrap and that judge will tell my ex what they are and this that it doesn't happen, you'll come away from demoralised and depressed and you very rarely get cost orders in family law matters. So what that means is at the end of your trial when you try to say to the judge, or oh, the other side should pay my costs, very rarely will you get them. Don't spend £20,000 on a lawyer to get all the way to a final hearing simply to get the outcome that you were told you were going to get in your first hearing. Oh, sorry, your first meeting with your lawyer. <laughs> That's the truth. Traditionally, um, quite often it would lead the solicitors and the parties to having to go to court. Uh, and if you go to court, then there's a lot of time and effort involved, and that equates to a lot of legal bills. But also incredible stress, and because you don't know what's going to happen next. Even even the solicitors and the professionals don't really know what's going to happen next. Um, so any alternative is, is better than that, in, in my view. Uh, and collaborative law does give you that uh, that different alternative. Children mediations are often the most difficult because they're so emotional, and uh, it's difficult for parents often to compromise about their children in the way that they they might more easily do when it comes to money. You can't cut children in half, for example. And so um, it really can be very difficult, very fraught and very anxious. And something I've noticed is that couples come into mediation often quite angry with each other and very suspicious and resentful. Um, and it's a great sense of achievement when you've worked with a couple through mediation and you've been able to break down those barriers and help them to understand each other and, and understand each other's fears. I think the beauty of collaborative law is that it's a small step, isn't it? It's a small step <clears throat> where um, both parties are saying to one another, well, I'm prepared to trust you enough to go and sit down with you and to discuss these very important things with you. And from that basis, trust can grow. And I feel very much that this is very important, that the more you communicate, the more you give it a chance, the more trust can grow from those small kernels. 
come away from a poor relationship, you, the best thing you should do is try to establish a working relationship at least for the purposes of your contact with your children because the children will benefit from observing you both as parents working together. And from a ch child's perspective, the last thing you want to see is the opposite of, of gripes and anger, doorstep arguments, uh, even telephone comments to the child as well as to the mother. The mother coming away from the telephone upset and angry, that doesn't help uh, in an environment where you are wanting that child to see you with some respect and with love and affection and to understand that notwithstanding you're separated now, as parents, they both, you, you both as parents, love and support that child, come what may. It was a very acrimonious separation with a lot of bitterness on each side, but don't ever remember being sat down and told what was happening, the facts of the situation. What I did hear was the bitter comments from each side about the other, and what I saw was all the revenge tactics being thrown around with not much regard for my sister and I stuck in the middle. I never thought it affected me that much growing up. It was such a normal part of my life, but it bothered me when I'd hear the comments about the other. I don't think they ever thought about the fact that it wasn't just their ex-partner that they were insulting, it was my mum or my dad. But it wasn't until a few years ago, when I reached my twenties and started to think more seriously about my romantic relationships and the future of them, that I realised how much of an effect their divorce had had on my views of relationships and of marriage. We are all a product of our experiences, and I can trace many of the issues I have now with, within relationships, commitment, trust, and even simple things like how to treat a partner, back to the divorce and what followed. I was never given a chance to talk it through with somebody, and my parents were too wrapped up in their own bitterness at the time to take a step back and think about how it would affect their children. I think that's why I think mediation and counselling are so important for everyone involved in a divorce. The effects can be long-lasting and life-changing, and I see a lot of defensiveness from parents going through a divorce. No one wants to admit that they're about to do something, however necessary it may be, that will have a negative effect on their child. But it's so important to address it early, and to address it well, and your children will thank you for it. Do you think that um, it's easy for families who are no longer living in the same house together to spend Christmas together? Um, most families no, but it's easy for us. And why is that? Because you're good friends with Dad. And has that always been the case? Um... Since I can remember, but I'm guessing it wasn't just after you had broken up. <laughs> no. That's just a wild guess. It was it was trickier then. And so what what's your message um, as someone who's 13 to parents who are going through family breakup with regard to, to Christmases in the future? With regard to Christmases... Break up right, please don't fight. And what does that mean? It means break up without fighting loads and still be friends. So you can spend Christmas together and not annoy your kids. The evidence indicates that the effects of separation on children can be limited and the child can emerge free of any long-term harm. Although there is no comprehensive formula to follow, to ensure a positive outcome for the child, a number of key factors seem to be associated with this. Competent and warm parenting from both parents. Continuing good relations and cooperation between parents. Social support for the child, such as extended family and friends. Children this age require consistency and routine and are comforted by familiarity. Therefore, it's helpful to maintain normal daily routines, particularly regarding sleep and meals during and after the divorce. Provide your child with his favorite toys or security items and spend time holding him and offering physical contact and comfort. Rely on the help of friends and family and be sure to get plenty of rest so you'll be alert when your baby is awake. My three children have grown up into teenagers. 
and my youngest only remembers how mum and dad have always lived apart. Even though the stress of breakup did, I'm sure, impact upon his health and psychological development, I'm not worried. Because his dad and I have worked hard to be civil and kind and to let the love of our children spread out into the love of everyone whom our children care about. My son Joe says... Our son Joe says, please don't fight, break up right. I like to say, I don't have a broken family. I have an extended family. Are you going to Scarborough Fair? Sing parsley, sage, rosemary and thyme. Remember me to one who lives there. And she She'll be 